Hi, I'm Cliff Brockman, a retired journalism professor from Wartburg College in Waverly, Iowa. On August 27th, 2021, I visited with Paul Benson, who was 94 at the time. Paul is the retired general manager and former part owner of KAYL Radio in Storm Lake, Iowa. First, just a little history. KAYL signed on the air in 1948. The FM signed on a year later in 1949. The station was founded by a group of local businessmen in Storm Lake. Paul began working at the station in the early 1950s. Then in 1972, Paul, station manager Chuck Nye, and some local businessmen purchased KAYL. Paul became the general manager and Chuck Nye became the station manager. In 1990, Paul and his partners sold the station and Paul retired. Later, he and his wife moved to the Des Moines area, which is where I interviewed Paul in his home. As a side note, I worked for Paul at KAYL Radio as the news director for six years, starting in 1975. Here now is my conversation with Paul Benson. Thanks for joining me, Paul. It's good to see you. Well, it's good to talk to you. Oh, it's good to see you, too. Well, thanks. Um, let's start way back. You lived in, grew up in Keokuk, was it? I grew, grew up in Keokuk, huh? And then uh, how did you decide to get into radio? How did well, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I listen to radio, and I, I guess I just had the idea that it was, when I got out of the service, I was after I was in the Army for a year and a half, I had to find something to do, so I thought, I'll, I'll be a radio announcer. So then I went to radio school when they had a school. They had two schools in Minneapolis, and so I went to one of them, and they had teachers who were all broadcasters that taught you how to, how to, how to do the news, how to do the sports, and all that. So that's where you learned all this stuff. And then that was, a, I think it was a six-month course. And uh, then after you uh, graduated from that, they said they'd get you a job somewhere. And so I went to radio school in Minneapolis, and uh, that was quite a ways away from Keokuk. And I remember I had, took a bus up there. It took me quite a while to get there. But anyhow, I, I went to uh, radio school, and uh, and then I, after I graduated from radio school, I had to find a job in a radio station. Mm -hmm. And see, I was probably got, at that time, they probably had 60 radio stations. They might have more than that. Now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I was willing to take a job in any station. And uh, so I put my name in. I wrote 55 letters that year. I, I always remember that. And, and but, then, but I was living with my parents after I graduated. And that's, this was a month in January. And uh, so I, but I never got much response until finally I got called by Storm Lake because that's where Andy Stotts was. He went to radio school with me. And he said, oh, I know that guy. So he said, sure, he, hire him. So he called me and says, are you interested? I said, yeah, I'm interested. I, I'm, I want to go to work. So I got on a bus and went to Storm Lake and didn't even have to. I just walked in the door and he says, you're hired. Didn't talk to me or anything else. I, I sent him a letter too. See. So that's how I got hired there because I knew Andy. And Andy and I were not. Andy was the clown in radio, if you remember Andy. He was the clown, but he was just delightful. But he, but he uh, he finally left and went into television later on, you know. So, but then I, I I worked in Storm Lake for quite a while, doing a little bit of everything. And I remember when we when we did commercials, why sometimes it would take us, and we always made triplicates of them. We did that because if I had a commercial for you, uh, I made it three copies: one so that we could use it for putting on the announcers to use, one to send it to you, and one for the file. Well, I never understood why we did that. After a while, we quit doing that. But anyhow, you had you had carbon copies of commercials sitting around the room, I, uh, and so that's the way it was started out. So I wrote commercials, and we used to we'd work we'd work sometime to eight, nine o'clock at night, and then we go down to. Shorty Pretzels, remember Shorty uh, Pretzels restaurant in Storm Lake? Mm -hmm. We go down there and have a cup of coffee, 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. Next morning, we go through the same routine again. And of course, I was single then, so I didn't have anything, any other place to go. And at that, that time, all I did was write commercials. And we made triplicates of everything. Well, after I was there a while, we stopped that because 
we we throw some of them away in order to, to we had commercials stacked all over the place, and uh, so we finally convinced the manager you don't need to have to, you have a copy for your file and that's it. So and I kind of really liked doing it. See, and I I was there for quite a while. And then, of course we start changing personnel and, and then I did skip once. I I went to, and then I went to Webster City yeah. for a short period of time. But Webster City was owned by a newspaper. And uh, they they dictated all, the, and they had some guys that were there for a good number of years, and I wasn't really very happy. And I and I did copy, I, I did all the commercials, I did the I cataloged the music, because you know when you got a when you got a record coming, you had to catalog it so that the announcer would know if you wanted to play a certain song, it, it was number three forty four in the catalog. So we had all these records cataloged, and so I had to do that. So I had to do a lot of things like that that the old timers weren't too crazy about in the Webster City Station because it used to be, if they wanted to play records, they'd go to the record fail and <laughs> grab some records and take them in there and play them. Well, if you wanted certain songs, you got to look them up. And so one job I had at Webster City was to catalog every one of those songs, which was quite a task, see. But then at that time, I was also going with my wife-to-be uh, that uh, she was back in teaching in Storm Lake. And so I, I kind of, and I used to drive back and forth uh, when I was in Webster City, and that's 90 miles. And I'd, I'd drive over on, on Saturday night and go to see my girlfriend, and then I'd come back on Sunday night. Well, a lot of times on Sunday night, I don't, next morning, I didn't remember when I got back in town because I would get back there late, you know. So uh, then I had an opportunity to go back to Storm Lake Later on, Mr. Graw, who was the owner, well, co-owner, he was looking for somebody, and so he, I, I was recommended by one of the guys, Andy, Andy says, hire Paul. So I went back to Storm Lake, and I stayed there all that time. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So then what did you do when you went back to Storm Lake? Well, I, I uh, of course, I had to find a place to live, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't remember... At that time, you 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 boarded in you, uh, maybe in your younger days. I don't know if you ever went went into a boarding ha house. Uh, in Storm Lake, there was Honey Miller uh, was living in Storm Lake, and she had a uh, she was a widow, and she had rooms and she rented them out, and they were considered luxury rooms. But I didn't get a couldn't get a room at her place. But she told me someone else, so I stayed with the Middle Stots in Storm Lake, and they were right on the lake. They had a room. And I got a room for, uh, you got a bed to sleep in and uh, showered and all that stuff. You didn't get uh, food there. But I remember it was $7 a month to cost at that time. I lived there for quite a while. And, of course, I had to get all my meals out. I had to go to le restaurants and get them all out. And so, I had, so I'd go to a lot of, you get acquainted with a lot of restaurants while I was doing it. So I, I, I lived there for quite a while and then, uh, I forget where I moved at. Well, I never did get into Honey Miller's place. She had, it was always somebody wanted to live there. But anyhow, just stopped to think, $7 a month. Uh, but then the place I got later, I stayed was $8 a month, and I got breakfast with that one. So I was, but anyhow, that's the story of, and that's when I met Andy Lynn, and Andy was the real popular announcer at KYL for years. Andy was a, just a delightful person. And uh, and I got to know him, and then of course he left. So, uh, but I st stuck with KAYL from that time after I, after Webster City. I just stayed there all that time. Probably be there today if it hadn't been somebody bought the station out. Well, what kind of programming did you have back then when you were there? Was well, live programming? the 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 AM was all uh, popular music. Well, we had an hour of classical music, uh, and we did. Uh, uh, it was. It was. We'd play the popular songs and the old songs, and we had a. At that time, they had records were they had the big 33s, that were transcriptions, and on a 33 disc, uh, it was this about this wide. It was probably, well, you can't see it, but uh, and uh, they they'd have uh, eight songs or six songs on each side. So if you wanted, to, well, just name any song. Why you, you it was a tra it was a transcription see and also you put the needle on the inside and it worked its way out whereas uh, along later you put the needle on the outside and worked its way in, 
But anyhow, we had those that we started with. I remember that. And, uh, well, and, and the, everything was so different. You And you, like I say, you had wire recordings. You started with wire recordings, and then you went to regular tape recordings, and then you went to uh, eight-track tapes. And now I don't know what they do. You know, it's all modern stuff. But uh, uh, so so you, you lived through a lot of changes that we had. But the 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 theme always was you had to be a, a community radio station. You had to do things that no one else would do, like on a newspaper. You know, a newspaper puts out the, the local news. And so that was one thing that we were successful, that we did have a news department. We had a sports department of people that knew what they were doing, and, 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 and you yourself were in a news department. And that's when we had probably the best newsman we ever had, which when you were there. Because I remember you knew what you were doing and you were didn't have to be told. But uh, and then then I don't whether you remember Bob Wilson when he was there. Uh, he was in sports. Bob was a really good sports caster, and he did play by play. But he was also uh, he came came to work in the morning and the Elks had a remember the Elks used to be up up above the radio station. Mm-hmm. Bob would go up to the Elks, and if he had a sports show on at two two thirty in the afternoon. He'd, he'd be up at the Elks, and he'd be there until about, uh, oh, maybe 2.20. And then he'd come walking up and, and uh, go on the air, see. And that's when we tried playing jokes on him. We'd put a c- commercial in there with a with a nasty word but uh, because he, he, he just did everything cold. But Bob was an excellent sportsman. He was a really good sportscaster. But then he, he, he moved off to somewhere else and... Bob, by the, Bob moved to Sioux City, and I don't know what happened to him after that. Tell me about uh, that story you were telling me about Bob Wilson, and you uh, slipped some special copy in there. Oh, yeah, well, the, you know, you, you, the guys are trying to be clowns, and they were always warned that that you, you don't act up on the radio because the listener doesn't know. You, you sit at home, you hear something f- funny or something, you hear, what, what's that mean? Or you don't hear anything. And so, but but we still had announcers that thought, well, we got to do some pranks. So when Bob was uh, there, he he was one of those who didn't pick up the commercial until he was going to read it. So we wrote a commercial that had had uh, told him that you don't have to go to such and such, go to Bob Wilson's house of prostitution. Well, it's a, and we were bound and turn it. We weren't going to let it go on the air. But he picked up the commercial and he started reading it. Uh oh, we thought, oh, we, we got to go in there and get it. Well, it didn't work. He didn't. When he hit that, he didn't say it. He he was good enough that he was professional enough that he didn't read it. And so then, but we caught hell from the manager after that. So we learned we better not quit trying to break. But there was always guys trying to do that. So. <clears throat> well, then you were there quite a while, and uh, then. Uh, chance to buy the radio station came along. How did that? Well, it was quite a while after that because after I, I was, I went, I went to Webster City for a short period of time, mm-hmm. and then when I went back in, uh, when when they, the guys that owned the station, there were four, there were five owners, and one of them had died. Uh, when they wanted to sell the station, I don't know why they wanted to sell it, but they wanted to sell it because the radio station, from day one, was always a money maker, which it, in those days that wasn't always the case. Sometimes you you lost money for a while until you got going good, but we always made money because we had a lot of good uh, sponsors. We had pennies, we had the grocery stores, we had, and and that's what it's, you got to have a lot of good advertisers. So we didn't have any trouble th- then, but times change, you know, and uh, uh, I well, uh, the radio radio cha- has changed so much since, since then now. Uh, I wouldn't know. Well, I I don't know what KAYL does anymore. But then uh, there's still. But 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 we we really had a good audience because we had people from Sac City and Ida Grove and all around who would report to us, and uh, so we really had a well managed station. And uh, when the time came for us to take over, well, we had good good personnel. And like when you when you came to us, we we got a number one newsman then. Uh, we did, and that was very important. That's why people listen to the radio station, and in and in small markets, I think they still do, because where else are you going to hear the funerals? Where else are you going to hear the scores right away? Where else are you going to hear who died, or you know things like that? 
so, um, uh, but the trouble is, radio stations started getting canned too much. They went to music and and, and now see, K A Y O. You tell me now is a, a Spanish all on the AM side, and when when I first started there, FM was a new thing, and the only reason K A Y O got a, a, an FM station was because the AM station could only operate on sunrise to sunset hours. So in the winter time, we couldn't sign on the air until 7.45, and we signed off at 5, 4.45. So the management thought, well, we need more time than that. So FM came along, and FM was on the short wave system, and uh, it was uh, not many people had FM radios. And when we first went to FM, I know we had a program, they had a program then to try to get you to buy an FM radio set. So then, and then on FM, we turned that to what we called the beautiful music. And that's all we played on FM was, you might call it classics, but we played just what we call beautiful music. And uh, the old songs that you might, most everybody knows. And, and we had less, less commercials. But on the FM, we could broadcast till 10 o'clock at night. So then we could carry the baseball or the sports events of, of the Storm Lake Tornadoes or the, or the Buena Vista Beavers. We could carry sports which is what you wanted to do in, in a, as a local station. So that's when we had a, uh, we started broadcasting till sports was over. So we carried, uh, in those years after the FM, we carried uh, almost all of Buena Vista sports and all the Storm Lake sports uh, because, and, and then people, and, and, and so as a result, they sold a lot of FM radios back in those days because it was something new. Now I don't know what they do on the FM, see. But all we played on FM was we did use a lot of recorded music, and at that time, you had re you had record cabinets that were as long as that your that couch is that was just full of music. Now I think it's all on tape, probably. I don't know because I've never been there. But then, uh, <coughs> but 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 a lot of things has changed since uh, since those days. Well, I was thinking about this. Um, used to be that the uh, engineers had to be out at the track. Sure. Yeah. Signal. Tell, tell us about that. Well, at that time you had to have an engineer at the transmitter because uh, if you if you got a lightning hit or you went off the air, you had him out there to fix it. See, well, when we always had an engineer there, the first when I first started working there, and sometimes he would fall asleep uh, because he didn't have anything to do, and out there, and, and and of course that changed over the years. A lot of stations they they put their studio or the tower or the headquarters were too. But uh, at that time, so we had, uh, we had, we had, that happened a lot of times where the, uh, something would happen, we'd go off the air, and then you'd say, I remember we had three engineers, and that's all they did was engineering. And you'd say, where is he, where is he? Well, you'd find out he went to sleep. <coughs> Didn't happen very often, but it did happen now and then. But then we got away from that so that you could uh, 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 work with the, uh, uh, you just had to, you had to keep track of it. That's all. You didn't have to. You got in the early morning and signed it on, and in the evening and signed it off. Well, then when FM came along, then you had two stations to worry about. See, and uh, <coughs> so it, it was it was a new thing. Uh, but uh, well, you know, as we as we got so we, we learned to adjust to all this, but. Uh, I look back now and I think, I don't know, that really was old-fashioned, all the stuff we had to do. But, uh, and a, but, I, but I always enjoyed it, and uh, I, never do much, I never did much on the air because I never thought I had a good voice for it, but, uh, but, I, but I did like writing commercials. And, uh, and, and in those days, you wrote a lot of commercials. Now, well, the commercials, a lot of them are supplied to them, I suppose. But I'm not familiar at all what's going on there now, but then... Uh, but 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 radio is like everything else, like newspapers, it, it changes, and uh, and if the, and if, if they're not serving their people that they live there, then they're not going to last too long. Uh, I I know we had we always had we were always uh, when surveys were taken, we were always the number one or two station back in Buena Vista and Ida and Sac and Pocahontas counties. Now not Clay County, but Clay, Clay County had. Had, had the Spencer radio station, which was very successful, but uh, and I was just lucky we, we, we I was there at the right time, and then we had management that knew what was going on, and you learned from that. See, 
And well, I do remember you used to write editorials and would sometimes do those on Saturday mornings. I remember that because mm -hmm. that was my job to play those on mm -hmm. Saturdays. Did you ever stir anything up? With oh, that? I got in trouble quite a few times. Yeah, I think in a small town. You can easily get in trouble, and and you got small town people. Hey, you! Uh, but I didn't. I didn't do a, a, most of the editorials I wrote, so I had I couldn't take the blame for it. But <laughs> but uh, w but we, we we didn't do a lot of it. But now Mr. Graw did some of it. You know, he always had some. But Mr. Graw was a fine old gentleman. He really was, and but he didn't know sickum about radio. But it didn't matter. He knew about business. And that's because, and, and, and thanks to him, that's why we were able to buy the radio station. When he came and said, well, we're going to sell it. Do you want to buy it? Well, we, Chuck and I didn't have any money. You know, I was young, married, had a family. But we knew the bankers. We knew the George Shaler over at the Citizen First Bank. And I remember uh, George, he was the son, wasn't he? He always said, I'm glad to see you come, Paul. Yeah, sure. We borrowed $50,000 from you. At, and at those days, interest rates were 13 percent, and uh, we I borrowed a lot of money at 13 uh, percent, and Harry Harry and George Shaler probably loved it because, but <coughs> but we always m made it back, you know. But it was always a good radio station from the standpoint that we had good listenership and and we had a lot of good sponsorship, and. But now radio today, I don't know, it's probably changed so much. And now in Storm Lake, I don't know what they do now that they're Spanish on the AM. I don't know how their audience is. But at that time, we felt, felt that we had we were the number one radio station. Uh, WHO might might have out they might have outdone us sometime, but uh, because they were the Iowa radio station, and probably today they still are. I don't know. But radio has changed so much, and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad I got out of it when I did, really. Do you, do you listen to radio now? I don't ever listen, or, or seldom listen to radio. Uh, I made a note that I wasn't, I, I listened to it every day of my life for 20 some odd years. And so I said, I'm, I don't, now my wife li always had a radio on. She always had it on. Well, when I was working there, she had it on because I was working there. But after that, well, she had the radio. Now, I don't even, I have a radio in the house, but I never turn it on. Mm -hmm. Now I don't watch news on television either, but that's just me, you know. I, uh, <coughs> but times change, you know. Yeah. So, you've mentioned a few times that things have changed. Do you think it's uh, better? I don't, radio is? I don't. I don't. I don't really know. Everything's different, you know. Uh, Television, you know, it isn't what it was like in the early days. I remember when television first started. Why that was, that was super. But I, I don't, I don't know because I don't listen to radio anymore. Now my daughter l listens to radio quite a bit, but I, but I, I don't really know what they do. And like in Storm Lake, their new location, uh, you, you, you lose a lot of your good advertisers. The chains went out, like pennies went out. Uh, you lose your, some of your good advertisers, and that's the key to radio station existing and uh, so I always thought we were I was always kind of proud that we were the number one station for quite a while but and I don't know what it's like now see I just know it's changed a lot well then uh, they came along and somebody offered to buy the mm -hmm. station so you sold it and retired how did, mm -hmm. how did that come about well the the the, the man that b bought it owned the station at Spencer and a couple of other places and he was looking to expand, and that time, small town radio stations, you could go out and buy them for a song. And they wanted to buy our radio station. Well, we never thought about it until after they made us an offer. And after we talked about it, then we, uh, we felt the offer they made us was too good to turn down. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite a, quite a bit of money. And so, so uh, and I talked to my wife, I said, well, well first of all, we've got to have some cash to put down, and we don't have it. We were raising seven kids, uh, but we. But I found a bank that was a tickle pink to loan us the money, so that's how we bought it. Uh, we had to come up with a down payment, and we were fortunate that we sold it to Mr. Graw and his group. Mr. Graw was always a very fair-minded person, 
And I know he told me, he said, Paul, you've worked for us for 20 years. Why, I think I should do something nice for you. So when we went to, so, so we bought it with, with a little, a small down payment. And so we pay, paid for it in 10 years. That is, we got paid, we had to pay for it in 10 years. And so when we sold it, uh, many, I don't know how many years I was there, uh, why, uh, I, my, uh, Joe Cavan was one of the owners and I, every month when, after we sold, every year after we sold it, we got a check for it. And so I'd get a check for, oh, I don't know, twenty five, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And of course that was my income afterwards. And I kept telling him, I said, I hope you keep, even when, you, when the 10th year came and they were through paying us, I said, well, you, you, you don't have to quit paying us, just get, send me that check, you know. Of course, he didn't do that, but <clears throat> but, but I, I, we were, I was really lucky in so many ways that I was in the right business at the right time. I had good teachers that taught me th things, uh, and I enjoyed doing it. Uh, now, I don't know if I'd want to do it today in radio because it's, well, things have just changed, and I really don't know, like I say, I don't listen to radio anymore. I was going to ask you, do you do you ever wish you were still in radio? No, I don't. I I was kind of glad that I got out when I did. Because when I came down here, I did a lot of volunteer work. And I volunteered at the food pantry for, oh, about five years, I think. I was, uh, well, you know, the food pantry collects food for people that they don't can't get. And somebody told me, uh, some somebody I met in Kiwanis when I got down there, I joined the Kiwanis Club. And he says they can, they need some help, so I got the job there. Well, with my experience in radio, that helped a little bit because I knew a little bit about contacting people. So at that time, I know we only had probably 25, 30 grocery stores that had barrels. So we were, and the first thing I did when I got on the Red Barrel Committee was paint the barrels red. And I remember Jack Kibberts, who owned a hardware store here, uh, he, uh, I, I worked with him, and I, he says, first thing we're going to do is paint the barrels red. Oh, all right. So we go behind a grocery store. Here's 20 barrels that we had to paint red with a brush. So after we got done, I had red shoes mm -hmm. and red socks and red hands, and he never let me live it down after that because, and that's why I got started with it. So then Jack was in charge of uh, red barrels at the time, so he kind of wanted to get out of it. So he, so he said, Paul, why don't you do it? So I took over the supervising the red barrel program in all these stores and then going to the grocery stores and saying, can we put a barrel in there? And then I had to get somebody to go pick up the food in that barrel. So that's when we uh, got service clubs like Qantas members, we say, hey, would you, would you go s pick up the food at such and such store? So we had a lot of volunteers, and they probably still do, see. But that changed a little bit, too, because now they buy a lot of food. Uh, the sister run the pantry, and uh, she ran the pantry. She knew what she was doing, and uh, you didn't run out of food when she was there. I mean, she knew it well, but it was fun. So I got, at one time, I could tell you where every grocery store in Des Moines was located, because I, I was in all of them, but now I couldn't tell you where they are. But yeah. Well, I think that's probably winded up. Is there anything else you can think of? Oh, I've been windy enough to... <laughs> <laughs> I could talk all day about some of the stuff we did, but uh, I, I, it would bore you because it, I, I was just lucky that I had, I had had a lot of people, good people I worked with, had good bosses, I had good teachers, I had a, a good wife that understood uh, that a lot of times I'd be out at night, well, at night uh, uh, helping with the basketball game, sometimes I'd go with Bob Wilson. I'd be his color man, and I remember we used to go to do f football game, high school football games. We'd go to Sioux Rapids to do a football game, and we'd park. We had a van, a similar van today, and and you you got up on top of the van, and he broadcast the f uh, and, and the football fields back in Sioux Rapids and Albert City were just nothing but corn pastures turned into football fields. And so, and I remember that uh, the one time I went out with Bob Wilson, uh, we were sitting on top of the van, and all of a sudden he slipped and whoosh, boom, he s and fell off the van. Well, I thought it was pretty funny. You know, well, he didn't get hurt, but he climbed back up and did that. Well, now that, see, we didn't have broadcast booths. Today, 
broadcasters have all fancy broadcast booths and they got uh, people to carry their equipment. And sometimes you had to go out and there was a telephone pole and up on the telephone pole, 15 steps up was a platform. You remember seeing some of those? Mm -hmm. That's where we broadcast from some of them. Well, that wasn't much fun because you didn't want to fall off that doggone thing. Mm -hmm. And then getting up there was another story. So, but uh, but I used to go with Bob once in a while when he did uh, sports. Cause Bob was a really good sportscaster. But he, but uh, but I'd, I'd be his commercial guy. And I and I remember we went to the fair one time. Well, we went to the fair several times. And they used to have harness racing at the fairs, if you ever remember the county fairs. And so we'd go, they'd sell that, and we'd broadcast it. Well, you broadcast a harness race, it's only maybe three and a half minutes long, you know. So the guys, you're the sportscaster, you broadcast it, da, da, and then I had to fill in afterwards while they were getting the horses ready for the next race. So I had 15, 20 minutes to, to sport to send. So that wasn't much fun because you, you had to track somebody down to talk to them or else make something up, see. And uh, so I, I, I went out, and I know the first, I used to go out with football, and and high school games, you know, they didn't have de decent broadcast booths. You broadcast from a post, you broadcast from a car, you broadcast from in most little towns. And I remember the, the year I got married, uh, when I went home after the game at night, my wife told me, you're, 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 you're your ice cold. I said, "Yes, sir. I sure need to warm up." I tell you, I, you just freeze to death. So I only did that a couple of years, but then I look back now. The the, the things, the funny things that happened to you uh, along the way. Uh, now broadcaster would say, "Oh, that uh, I can't believe it." You know, they got it made it because you did a lot of things that just were kind of silly. Well, I've got some fun story to end on, so I just. We'll stop there, and I want to thank you for your time. Well, I, I thank you for coming. I hope, hope they don't turn the radio off too soon when they hear this. So, Very good. Thank <coughs> you again. Paul Benson, uh, retired general manager, part owner of KEYL and Storm Lake. <coughs> thank you.